yourself and do jazz and good singing. Uh, I invite you to take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. <clears throat> Jesus' name. 
Amen. Um, just a little bit about the context here. You'll see the first word. We're we'll still looking at five verses, lots of different insights. James. Well, who's James? Who's writing this? You know that there are, does anybody know how many Jameses there are in the Bible? At least in the New Testament? Five. Something I learned. I'm not excited about this. There's five different Jameses in the Bible. Don't look there now, but in Mark 15, 40, there's a James. It says this. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph and Solomon. Solomon. All right, this James the Younger is the only time he's mentioned in the Bible. So you can tell right away that he's probably not this James that wrote our epistle. Another verse I found interesting because there are three Jameses mentioned in one verse. It's only five Jameses, but three are mentioned in one verse. It's Acts 1.13. It says, when they arrive, we're talking about the uh, disciples now. We have the 12 disciples, no longer Judas, so we're down to 11. It says, uh, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, and James. Huh? The top three, James and John. That's one James. And Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus. That's another James, the second disciple named James. And then Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. Three James, one verse. The last James, Judas, son of James, again, the only time we see him mentioned in the Bible is in this verse. So it's probably not him who wrote this epistle. Then we have James, son of Alphaeus. He's one of the twelve disciples. He's mentioned each time that the disciples are listed there. But that's all, only about three or four times in the Bible. But then we have Peter, John, and James. Now this James, very well known. Sons of son, son of thunder, uh, one of the first disciples of uh, Jesus. But does anyone remember what happened to this James? James, the disciple, the apostle? <laughs> it's not, uh, just listen here. Uh, he, uh, oh yes, Acts 12, 2. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some of those that belonged to the church, intending to persecute them, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. So early on in the church, James the Apostle, the brother of John, was put to death by Herod. So that leaves us with the only other option, which is James, the half-brother of Christ, of Jesus. You'll remember that Mary had other children after giving birth to Jesus. In Matthew 13, it says uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters, including James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And so James, who wrote what we're looking at today, was the second of five boys. He became a leader of the mother church in Jerusalem. He was the moderator of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And thus, James, the half-brother of Jesus, became an important leader of the early church. And he's the one who wrote this epistle. Now, why do I say all that? I say all that because it just shows, with some study and some diligence, you can find from the Bible who wrote James. You don't have to just say, oh, uh, look, it says author James. <laughs> you can do it yourself. You don't always have to depend on other people. It's good to look in uh, commentaries and see what others have said, but from the scriptures yourselves, you can find out lots of things from the Bible. <laughs> Second thing I wanted to point out is that James says he's a servant of God. Other versions, a slave of God. Can I suggest to you that we're all slaves of something? What could we be slaves to? I think some answers here. We could be slaves to, to who or to what? To our job. To our job. We could be a slave to our job. To ourself. We could be a slave to ourselves. To our habits. We've got two answers here. To our habits. To our habits. A slave to our habits. So, Good ones or bad? You'd be a slave to money. Slave to money. Well, you guys hit some good ones. Now, all these verses are popping in my head. We can't serve both God and man or money. Uh, slaves to our, uh, to our habits. We were once slaves to sin. Another one. We'd be slaves to sin, but 
Now we are slaves to righteousness, slaves to God. Marcel said, slaves to ourselves. You know, I believe we are all as slaves to somebody. And I can't, every slave has a master. And you can't find a better master than God. Better than, better than me. It's better than our... Uh, you, you, every person has a master. And it's a real privilege to have God as our master. And James calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moving on to verse 2. Hope you still have your Bibles open. I mean, a lot in James chapter 1. I'll be looking around other passages, probably a little too fast, but stay with me in James, because we're on to verse 2 now. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers. You see, James is writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have the Holy Spirit living in them. And what does he say? He says, whenever you face trials. Notice he doesn't say, if you face trials. But when. And you notice that there's trials of many kinds. Okay? Um, no matter what trial you might be facing today, be a different trial for different people. But no matter what trial you're facing, there's two good aspects, aspects to always remember. One, the trial you're facing, I can guarantee you, it will not last for eternity. <laughs> might be the last long, might last your own lifetime, but the trial you're facing will not last for eternity. And you need to remember that. And secondly, the trial you're facing, God will give you the grace to endure it. Two things to remember about trials. And now we come to a question. Why is it that we can rejoice in trials? I believe it's because of the benefits that come from them. And what are the benefits that come from trials, just according to verse 3 now? You may have a lot of different benefits and experiences, but according to verse 3, what is a benefit that comes from trials? Verse 3. Perseverance. Perseverance, exactly. I like to try to use a little math equation here. You're going to help me out here. I hope I don't end up dropping all my papers here. <laughs> but you all know what this sign is here. It's the plus sign, right? <coughs> plus. So let me just illustrate this. What do we have here? Okay. Plus. put equals, I put produces, okay? Faith plus trials produces perseverance. Oh, isn't that nice? No PowerPoint there, but there we go. Got that close? All right. Now, let's go on to the next verse, because what happens if we have, well, let me put it this way. Help me out here. Faith. Next verse. Maturity. Maturity. Look at it. Don't just trust my little papers here. Verse 4 says, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay? Now, interesting, verse 5 goes on to say, if you lack wisdom. So if you're in a trial, you've got your faith and you're persevering, that will produce completeness and maturity, but if you lack, still lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be giving to him. And believe me, when you're in trials, you need God's wisdom, don't you? And that's what I want to talk about now, is what is wisdom? 
something that God wants to give us, but what are some definitions that you have of wisdom? Or what comes to mind when you think of wisdom? Seeing things God's way. Oh, there's a good one. Seeing things God's way. That's wisdom. Very good. Something else. Another definition or something that comes to your mind of wisdom. What is wisdom? Seeing things God's way. Very good. Oh, your thumb. Things and, and speak. Hold your tongue. That's what I thought she said. Holding your tongue. Wisdom to know the difference. Pardon me? Wisdom to know the difference. Oh, yeah, wisdom to know the difference. Age. Age <laughs> could be there. Age. Knowledge. Pardon me? Knowledge. Knowledge. Most often with wisdom. Trusting the word of the Lord. Trusting mm -hmm. the word of the Lord. I like to define wisdom this way, and this is not original with me, and a lot of this comes from my uh, Bible teacher, Dr. Bill Thrasher, uh, what we're going to see next. He, he defines wisdom three different ways. I wasn't able to put it all together. One is uh, the ability to see life from God's point of view, kind of like the gentleman said there. If you have wisdom, you have the ability to see life from God's point of view. The ability to see people the way God sees people. You know that person at work I'm talking about, or that person in school that you just can't quite get along with. How does God see that person? Or how about that situation, that problem you're having in the home or someplace? How does God see that problem? How does God see that situation? That's what wisdom is, is seeing life from God's point of view. That's what God wants to give us. He wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us this ability to see things the way He sees them. That's the first definition. The second one is the ability to make the best goals in life. And to reach those goals by the best means. You know, what, what are the best goals in life, really? I'm sure we could come up with Quite a good list. I'm not, I'm not sure if I want you to answer now, but just think. What are the best goals in life? Let's really think about this. And maybe you can write that down. What are the best goals in life? Well, and what's for what, me it's spending time with the Lord each day. Okay, spending to, time in the Lord each day. To discipline myself to sit down with him. Yeah. That's a very good goal. To become like To know Him. All these good ones we have in our head, are we using the best means to, to achieve these goals? Because we can have, uh, it's very easy, not easy, but it's possible to be diligent and to be a hard worker, but for all the wrong things. We might have those right goals in our mind, but they're not really in our hearts. So often we try to store up for ourselves earthly treasures that moth and rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal. So wisdom is that having that ability to make the best goals in life, the truly the best goals in life, but also having the means to reach those goals. This is in my own life. Yeah, I can, I can say some really good goals, but daily, am I using the best means to achieve those goals or do I have too many other things taking my attention. And then the third definition of wisdom is the skill of living life before God. You know, there's a skill to carpentry. There's a skill to handling money, to being a successful <coughs> marriage partner, to parenting, to relating to people. There's a skill to handling our tongue. And there's a skill to living life. But all too often, people will say, well, I know how to live life. I don't need that skill. I, I, know, I know what to do. And we miss something. We've put together an educational structure that teaches people how to make a living, but not how to live. It takes great wisdom to be, say, a father or a husband. But many times there's not a lot of training on how to be a father. 
God wants to give us that training. God wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us the skill of living our life openly before Him. Transparently before Him. Honestly just sharing our life with Him. That's what God wants to give us. That skill of living our life honestly before Him. Those are the kind of three definitions of wisdom. See life from God's point of view. Have the best goals in life and the best way to reach those goals. And then just live your life openly and honestly before God. That skill. Now, what is the value of wisdom? Oh, I got this here. Value. Is wisdom valuable? Say I got two boxes. Box number one. Thanks, big green box. All desirable things. Everything you could desire, we're going to put in box number one. Box number two, wisdom. You can choose one box. Somehow this box is very desirable, isn't it? Everything we could ever desire. But this box here is even more valuable. Proverbs 8.11 For wisdom is more precious than rubies. And nothing you desire can compare with her. That's the value of wisdom. Now, to close, don't worry, we've got eight points to close with, or nine. <laughs> so I'm not done yet, but I got nine points on how to gain God's wisdom. And I hope you might want to jot a few of these down, okay? Because they're really good, but you got to put them in practice. <clears throat> Thankfully, the Bible gives us many practical ways to gain God's wisdom. The starting place is you need to recognize your need for it. Recognize your need for it. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, It is not for man to direct his steps. And that's where we have to start. We have to realize that I'm a sheep, and, and I don't know how to get where I'm supposed to go. I need a shepherd. With humility, that's humble to say that, but with humility comes wisdom, Proverbs 11, 2. We need to recognize our need for wisdom. Paul says it a bit stronger. He says, to him who wants to be wise, first, admit you're foolish. And kind of the opposite of that, same truth though, Although they claim to be wise, in Romans chapter 1, they became fools. So the starting place for gaining God's wisdom is recognizing your need for it. And whatever is in your life that makes you recognize your need for God's wisdom, you can thank God for that. In other words, you might be experiencing some unpleasant trial, something that's not very pleasant. But if that causes you to recognize your need for God's wisdom, then that's a good thing. And you can thank God for that. A second way to gain God's wisdom is to recognize the value of wisdom and to desire it above all else. Desire it above all else. We have the example of Solomon. You know, young King Solomon, he had a new responsibility, and so he's going to ask God for one thing. He asked God for wisdom. He says, God, I'm like a little boy. I don't know how to go in and how to go out. I need your wisdom. And God was pleased with that request of Solomon. Solomon didn't always live by the wisdom God gave him. But that desire that Solomon had is something that we should imitate and go after. A third way to gain God's wisdom is to cultivate a fear of God. We read that this morning, didn't we? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Or fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fools scorn wisdom and discipline. Proverbs 1. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a kind of fear that we read about in uh, Exodus 20, 20, where it's Moses says to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Fear of God is a deep respect of God. God says, fear me, don't be afraid. A true fear of God, if you truly have a true fear of God, 
that will deliver us from unhealthy fears we have of people, or other, other unhealthy fears we have in our life. If we truly have a fear of God, that will deliver us from unhealthy fears in our life. Number four, another way to gain God's wisdom is to diligently and prayerfully study the Scripture. God's will is always in harmony with the principles of His Word. And Paul tells Timothy, the Scriptures are able to make us wise, even wise unto salvation. We're to go after wisdom as we went for hidden treasure. Jesus, in his humanity, grew in wisdom. And that should be our desire as well, to continue to grow as God desires to give wisdom to us. Certainly through prayer, we can gain God's wisdom. As we are looking at James chapter 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God. Prayerfully ask God for wisdom. For specific wisdom, for specific situations. Wisdom to how to relate to this person, or how to relate to that person, or this situation. And then it, by faith, expect God to answer. Number five, a fifth way to gain God's wisdom. It's a pleasant way. It's called fellowshipping with the right people. That's a fun way. Proverbs says in 13.20, He who walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. You see, it doesn't matter if I, I don't want people around me to affect me. The fact of the matter is, people around me will affect me for good or for bad. And so we need to choose and cultivate the right kind of friendships that we have so that we can walk with the wise and become wise. A sixth way to gain God's wisdom is to have a teachable spirit. Have a teachable spirit. Even being willing to accept rebuke. Uh, always a fun thing. Rebuke. But listen, the way a person responds to rebuke will tell you a lot about that person, his character. You rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Rebuke a scoffer, and he will hate you. Teach a wise man, and he will be still wiser. You see, a person who is truly wise doesn't have a know-it-all attitude. They're always wanting to learn. They're always wanting to grow. And it's motivating to be around a person like that. Having a teachable spirit and being willing to accept the rebuke is a big part in how to gain God's wisdom. Okay, a seventh way to gain God's wisdom. I hope somebody is writing this down and will put it to practice this week. Seventh way is to trust in God and not in yourself. That's how you gain God's wisdom. Trust in God and not in yourself. Proverbs says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. 28, 26. And then in Ephesians 5, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Understand what the Lord's will is. And be filled with the Spirit. Trust in God and not in yourself. Give up the control of your life to God. That's what we talked about before. Let God be the master of your life. Trust in Him and trust in God's control. And you can gain wisdom. An eighth way to gain God's wisdom is to avoid evil. Be innocent of what is evil, but wise to what is good. You know, God does not want us to gain wisdom by doing a lot of experimenting with evil. Quite frankly, that's not how you gain wisdom. You only dull your spiritual senses by experimenting with evil. You get wisdom by learning the truth. And then you're able to discern the other. You've heard the example many times how they train cashiers with money. They give them the real dollar bill. They study that feel that, they study that, and then they know the fake. God wants
wants us to be avoiding evil and studying his word. And then the last way, the ninth way to gain God's wisdom. You see, wisdom is the pursuit of wisdom is to be a joy. Proverbs 10.23 says this, Doing wickedness is a sport to a fool. But so is wisdom to a man of understanding. <clears throat> Gaining God's wisdom is to be a sport, to be fun, to be a joy. And you can find great pleasure and delight in gaining God's wisdom. Let's pray. Father, I pray that I myself would use these nine ways, or at least some of them, to get wisdom in my life. And I ask you to forgive all these years I've known these truths and haven't prayed in my life. I pray for each person here too, Father, that something that was said today would encourage them to look to you for wisdom. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our wisdom. And we pray now that you would grant us your blessing in this endeavor of gaining your wisdom. We do this, Father, for your glory, but we realize that we will have an eternal benefit as well. And we say thank you. In Jesus' name.